Hey everyone, I'm Mr. Willis, and you will love economics. Everyone benefits when a market is at equilibrium. Through voluntary exchange, consumers and firms interact in the product market and eventually reach an agreement where both participants mutually benefit in the marketplace as utility and profits are maximized. Prices are optimal, the quantity supplied equals the quantity demanded, and the market is allocatively efficient. If you're still unable to see it, it's all good, because luckily for us, there's a way to actually visualize the total benefit for consumers and firms when a market is at equilibrium. It's called consumer surplus and producer surplus. Consumer surplus is the difference between the total amount that consumers are willing and able to pay for a good or service and the total amount they actually pay. Producer surplus is the difference between the total amount that firms are willing and able to sell a good or a service for and the total amount they actually receive when selling it. Think back on the scenario where you bought a new car. You walked into the car dealership looking to buy a new car, and you decided you weren't going to pay over $40,000 for it. That price was your buyer's maximum price. The dealer decided that he wasn't going to go any lower than $20,000 when selling you the car. That price was the seller's minimum price. After negotiations, you bought a new car at an equilibrium price of $30,000, a full $10,000 below your buyer's maximum. Not only did you get the car you wanted, but you saved $10,000 too. Meanwhile, the dealer sold you the car for $30,000, a full $10,000 above his seller's minimum. Not only did he earn profits, but he earned an extra $10,000 in his book. The extra $10,000 you saved was the difference between your buyer's maximum price and the equilibrium price in the market. In other words, it was the difference between what you were willing and able to pay and what you actually paid. The extra $10,000 the dealer earned was the difference between the seller's minimum price and the equilibrium price in the market. In other words, it was the difference between the price they received from the sale and what they were actually willing to sell the car for. From here, we can visualize the benefit you gained and the benefit the dealer gained from this transaction. The difference between your buyer's maximum price of $40,000 and the equilibrium price of $30,000 at a quantity of one car is the consumer surplus you gained in the market. The difference between the equilibrium price of $30,000 and the seller's minimum price of $20,000 at a quantity of one car is the producer surplus gained by the firm in the market. The areas shaded on this graph represent the consumer and producer surplus gained by you and the car dealership from voluntary exchange in the market. However, when analyzing an entire industry, Areas of consumer and producer surplus represent the benefits gained by all consumers and all firms through all transactions in the product market. Sure, your consumer surplus is $10,000 when buying a car. But what about every other consumer in the industry? What did they save? What about all the other car dealerships in the industry? What did they gain? Let's take a look at calculating consumer and producer surplus in a market. Calculating the consumer and producer surplus in a market is easier than it seems. In fact, it's all geometric. Calculating the area of these triangular areas will give us the sum of consumer and producer surplus in this market. Like any other triangular area, we can simply multiply one side by the other side and divide by two. In the case of consumer surplus, one side can be found by taking the difference between the buyer's maximum price and the equilibrium price in the market. The other side is equal to the quantity of output sold in the market. Take these two sides and multiply them, and then divide by two, and you'll find the total sum of consumer surplus in the market. In the case of producer surplus, one side can be found by taking the difference between the equilibrium price in the market and the seller's minimum price. The other side is equal to the total quantity of output sold in the market. Take these two sides and multiply them, and then divide by two, and you'll find the total sum of producer surplus in the market. Let's give it a shot. For example, suppose that this is the market for good A. The maximum price that consumers are willing and able to pay for good A is 
while the minimum price that firms are willing and able to sell at is $1. Now suppose that supply and demand in the market for good A establishes an equilibrium price of $3 and an equilibrium output of 100 units. After voluntary exchange between buyers and sellers, the consumer surplus gained by buyers in the market for good A totals $100, while the producer surplus gained by firms in the market for good A also totals $100. At equilibrium, consumers can buy good A at a price of $3 per unit. Some would have paid anywhere from $3 to $5 for good A, but because they can buy good A for $3 a unit, they satisfied their utility and saved a little extra at the same time. And so, through voluntary exchange, consumers can buy a good at a price they agreed to far below their buyer's max and can purchase it at a quantity that is allocatively efficient. This allows consumers to maximize their consumer surplus. Likewise, firms can sell good A at a price of $3 per unit. Some firms would have sold good A for as low as $1 to $3. But because they can sell good A for $3 a unit, they maximized their profits and earned a little extra at the same time. And so, through voluntary exchange, firms can sell a good at a price they agree to far above their seller's minimum and can sell it at a quantity that is allocatively efficient. This allows firms to maximize their producer surplus. When fundamental changes occur in supply and demand, the price and quantity of a good or service will change because there's a new equilibrium in the market. As price and quantity increases and decreases, consumer and producer surplus will increase or decrease too. But because the market is at equilibrium, the market remains allocatively efficient and consumer and producer surplus is still maximized. However, when government intervention is used in the market, it artificially alters price and quantity and will lead to disequilibrium. If price level increases, consumer surplus will decrease and producer surplus will increase as the product price is closer to the buyer's maximum price and further away from the seller's minimum price. If price level decreases, consumer surplus will increase and producer surplus will decrease as the product price is closer to the seller's minimum price and further away from the buyer's maximum price. Let's take a look at how intervention in the market will impact consumer and producer surplus. Let's begin with price controls. Suppose that supply and demand in the market for good B has established an equilibrium price of $5 and an equilibrium output of 200 units. To make good be more affordable for consumers, the government enacts a price ceiling at a price of $2 per unit, causing the quantity of output demanded to increase and the quantity of output supplied to decrease, resulting in a shortage in the market for good B. When price decreases to the new legal maximum of $2, the consumer surplus in the market will increase and the producer surplus in the market will decrease as the product price is closer to the seller's minimum price and further away from the buyer's maximum price. However, now that the quantity demanded by consumers is greater than the quantity supplied by firms, the market for good B has become allocatively inefficient, leading to the creation of deadweight loss. Deadweight loss is the total amount of consumer and producer surplus loss to both buyers and sellers due to market inefficiency. When the market for good B was at equilibrium, the quantity demanded equaled the quantity supplied, and the market was allocatively efficient allowing both consumer and producer surplus to be maximized. However, when government enacted a price ceiling at a price of $2 per unit, a shortage of good B was created, and the market became allocatively inefficient. Because of this market inefficiency, buyers and sellers lost a portion of the consumer and producer surplus they gained at equilibrium. The sum of consumer and producer surplus lost in the market because of market inefficiency is known as deadweight loss. Now suppose that supply and demand in the market for good C has established an equilibrium price of $3 and an equilibrium output of 500 units. To make good C more profitable for firms, the government sets a price floor at a price of $6 per unit, causing the quantity of output supplied to increase and the quantity of output demanded to decrease, resulting in a surplus in the market for good C and making the market allocatively inefficient. When price increases to the new legal minimum of $6, the consumer surplus in the market will decrease, and the producer surplus in the market will increase, as the product price is closer to the buyer's maximum price and further away from the seller's minimum price. 
However, now that the quantity supplied by firms is greater than the quantity demanded by consumers, the market for good C has become allocatively inefficient, and buyers and sellers lose a portion of the consumer and producer surplus they gained at equilibrium. This creates deadweight loss in the market for good C. Let's move on to production quotas. Suppose that supply and demand in the market for good X has established an equilibrium price of $4 and an equilibrium output of 900 units. In order to reduce the output of good X, the government enacts a production quota at a quantity of 600 units, cutting the quantity of good X produced by a third and effectively preventing the output of good X from reaching its natural equilibrium quantity of 900 units. The quota also establishes a new equilibrium and increases the price of good X to $7 per unit. Because output is limited to 600 units, the consumer surplus in the market will decrease and the producer surplus in the market will increase as the product price is closer to the buyer's maximum price and further away from the seller's minimum price. However, now that the output in the market has been restricted to 600 units, the market for good X has become allocatively inefficient and buyers and sellers lose a portion of the consumer and producer surplus they gained at equilibrium. This creates deadweight loss in the market for good X. Lastly, what about excise taxes? Suppose that supply and demand in the market for good Y has established an equilibrium price of $4 and an equilibrium output of 1,000 units. In order to reduce the output in the market, government imposes a $2 per unit excise tax on firms that produce good Y. In order to minimize their tax burden and avoid paying more in taxes, firms will scale back the production of good Y, leading to a decrease in the supply of good Y in the market. After the effects of the per unit tax, both the consumer surplus and the producer surplus in the market will decrease. Because the product price is closer to the buyer's maximum price, consumers must pay more for good Y and therefore save less when compared to their buyer's max. At the same time, firms may have sold each unit of good Y at a buyer's price of $5, but they only get to keep a seller's price of $3 per unit after paying the government the $2 per unit they owe in taxes. Compared to their seller's minimum price, this means they earn very little extra after all is said and done. In addition, now that government intervention has forced firms to reduce their output to 700 units, the market for good Y has become allocatively inefficient, and buyers and sellers lose a portion of the consumer and producer surplus they gained at equilibrium. This creates deadweight loss in the market for good Y. And that's consumer surplus, producer surplus, and deadweight loss. Be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red button below so you can receive alerts about new videos when they become available. If you enjoy the channel or find my videos useful, let me know by liking the video and feel free to leave a comment below. We have full video lectures on every topic in macro and microeconomics, as well as quick macro and micro minute videos for cram sessions and quick reviews. If you'd like to learn more, you can click here for my price elasticity video or you can click here for my micro minute video on calculating consumer surplus, producer surplus, and deadweight loss. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on Your Love Economics.